This lesson is part two of chapter 31, Richard Nixon's Domestic Affairs. The 1968 presidential election between Richard Nixon and Hubert H. Humphrey wasn't just notable for being the election that brought Nixon into the White House, but it was also a period of national disunity and social unrest which played out at the Democratic National Convention which was held in Chicago. Uh, there was also uh, an era of divide uh, caused further by the assassinations of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King that year. However, as it played out on TV, the Democratic National Convention was deeply divided um, and, and disrupted over by the anti-war protesters. Mayor of Chicago Richard Daley called in 12,000 police the National Guard, to help try to keep the peace. However, um, with all the unruly uh, protests and police brutality, there ended up being over 500 arrests and 100 police and 100 protesters that were injured uh, outside the convention. And so with the divide in the Democratic Party, it opened the door for Nixon to win the election in 68. And with his victory, he attempted to make Washington more efficient. He shifted responsibility for social problems to the state and local governments. And he tried to improve the economy. That, as well as uh, passing legislation to help protect the environment and create the EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency, um, those are some of the things that the Nixon administration will accomplish. As Nixon was running for president in 1968, he did appeal to what he called the silent majority. He said that most Americans were the non-shouters, the non-demonstrators, good, hard-working Americans that just went about their lives. After all, the, the 1960s was an era of activism with protests ranging from the Black Panthers, obviously the anti-Vietnam War protesters, women liberation, um, consumer rights, environmental rights, um, and other uh, ethnic minority rights, as well as those demonstrations that took place outside the Democratic Convention in Chicago, all kind of made it seem like America was kind of being torn apart at the seams. And Nixon had campaigned trying to you know, show that he would work to restore law and order inside the United States and appeal to those that kind of went about and just did their work as he thought good Americans should. One of the ways that Nixon attempted to reduce the uh, Washington bureaucracy and role of the federal government was by um, coming up with the idea of what's called revenue sharing. And uh, what this was, was the approach that the federal government not earmark and you know, give directly um, you know, financial support to different programs at the state level, but instead turns the money over to different government entities like state and local governments and let them choose how to best use the funds that the federal government had given them. Uh, this was a different approach than what uh, Johnson had taken, obviously, with his Great Society, which increased the bureaucracy and government spending. So Nixon, with his more conservative approach, uh, kind of left the state and local governments to determine how best to spend the, the funds. Turning to another issue um, of the time, deficit spending. Uh, when Nixon entered the White House in 69, after being elected in 68, he entered in an era where he saw unemployment and inflation both on the rise, and he found it was difficult to keep federal spending under control. Therefore, uh, Nixon turns to a practice which is called deficit spending. And what this simply is, is the uh, practice of where the government spends more money in a given year uh, than it takes in in revenue. Also at the same time, uh, to try to improve the economy, he issues two price freezes, each lasting several months, hoping that this would maybe stem that tide of inflation. <laughs>
Uh, but as you can see from the chart, uh, during Nixon's administration, uh, he was running a budget deficit each year. Yet another domestic issue that affected Nixon, and eventually Ford and Jimmy Carter as well, was the oil crisis. When the United States sided with its ally Israel in their war against Egypt and Syria, which I had talked about in part one of chapter 31, uh, the Arab nations of OPEC uh, kind of retaliated by imposing an oil embargo on shipping of oil to the United States. This resulted in high oil and gas prices, which then further you know, drove inflation even higher. And, and it, as you can see, it caused long lines at gas stations. And um, at times, stations even kind of ran out of gas, uh, which was a fear um, inside the United States, as we, are, we were, were and still are one, the leading nation in consumption of, of gas and, and uh, you know, electricity and you know, whatnot. Even today, our energy consumption leads the world. And as we see gas prices continue to creep up today, uh, that obviously affects shipping, uh, retail costs, and that will drive up the prices of clothing and food and basically everything that we consume. As the Vietnam War had been a massive drain on the economy and had caused for uh, a great deal amount of deficit spending, uh, the the effect that that's going to have eventually is a increase in inflation. By 1968, the cost of living was rising at uh, about five percent, uh, nearly double what it had been. And since Nixon was against you know uh, government spending more money, he actually chose to reduce government spending while encouraging the Federal Reserve Board to raise their interest rates, which would limit borrowing and therefore kind of lower the growth of um, business expansion and slow up um, you know, the inflation in theory. However, the results were quite different as inflation continued to rise. You can see by 1969 even reaching 6%. And at the same time, unemployment, which was at 4% roughly in 1970, uh, had increased to 6%, um, uh, which wouldn't prove good at all for Nixon. And with his handling of the economy and the mistakes he made, uh, the Democrats quickly came up with a, the term Nixonomics to refer to the, the economic disaster that was taking place, seeing an increase in unemployment and inflation. However, by August of 71, um, after having uh, announced yet another uh, freeze on wages and prices, as well as increasing the tax on imports, uh, which helped lead to a balance of trade, um, Nixon saw the economy kind of recover a little bit and saw um, unemployment drop as well as inflation slow up. But when it comes to Nixon and domestic problems. Uh, the most notorious issue he faced was obviously that of Watergate. Um, this scandal uh, revolved around the idea of Nixon uh, not wanting to have uh, the same thing happen to him that happened to Johnson, and that's be a one-term president. He, really, he wanted to make sure that um, you know, he could guarantee his election in 72, and Watergate will prove to be the beginning of the end for his administration. However, as you see here, um, Nixon probably wouldn't have even needed Watergate to ensure his re-election. And what it kind of comes down to is the idea that um, the Committee to Re-elect the President, or CREEP, used dirty tricks uh, to try to um, spy on the Democrats um, by breaking into their headquarters at the hotel complex known as Watergate. And at first, um, you know, when they were caught, they thought that these were just a bunch of burglars. Uh, 
but it turned out that they were bugging phones, sifting through files, trying to dig up garbage on the Democrats and kind of see what their plan was in the upcoming election. And as it was, it was further investigated, uh, it turned out that these burglars uh, had connections back to the White House and aides of the president. And with the subsequent investigations, um, it led to numerous resignations and prison terms for advisors um, and those close to Nixon. And as they continued their investigation, m more and more pointed to the fact that Nixon was kind of involved uh, in the cover-up uh, of Watergate um, and tried to uh, abuse his power uh, to slow up the investigation. And as things tightened around uh, Nixon, uh, and as more of his men were forced to resign or sentenced to prison, uh, Nixon continued to deny any involvement uh, in the uh, um, process. However, um, things continued to take a turn for the worse for Nixon, where it became known that uh, there were tape recordings um, of you know, conversations as was regularly done in the White House. And Archibald Cox, who was the special prosecutor, demanded that the tapes be turned over um, as he was investigating what was going on. Uh, however, Nixon fires him and appoints Leon Jaworski as the new special prosecutor. Um, however, he continues to demand the tapes as well, um, and eventually the Supreme Court in 1974 ruled that they had to be turned over. And when they finally were, even though Nixon had said, you know, claimed executive privileges and national security were at stake here, um, once they were turned over, four and a half minutes of them had been deleted. Um, and nobody knows what was on it, but they kind of questioned further, you know, why were those parts deleted? So with the continued resignation of top staffers and others already in jail, and as things continue to unravel for the president in regards to Watergate, things just continued to get worse. And by August of 1974 then, um, prior to being impeached on abuse of power and obstruction of justice, Nixon becomes the only president in the United States history uh, to resign. And there he was, as he had seen his Vice President Spiro Agnew already have resigned over other issues, as he had served in Congress and the Senate as Vice President under Eisenhower, um, as he had defeated Hubert Humphrey um, in 68, and George McGovern in 72, Richard Nixon resigns in 74 and his ideas of revenue sharing having ended the draft and gotten the United States out of war in Vietnam his broad environmental programs he had established his um, legacy in foreign affairs and creating of detente with the Soviets and having visited China all kind of get overshadowed as he leaves the office in disgrace. And we'll see the new uh, president, uh, Gerald Ford, come into office.